Hello guys, I've got a build of a fantastic kit for you here today. This is Airfix's brand new, just released, 135th scale Austin K2Y ambulance. So let's take a quick look at the box and what's inside and then we'll get on with the build process. So we've got this lovely box out on the front here of one of the schemes which is in SCC 15 which is the green scheme, Olive Drab. We can see here on the side of the box the four colour schemes. We'll look at those in a bit more detail later on, but let's have a quick look inside. There are quite a few inbox reviews of this kit out there already, so I won't go over the contents in extreme detail. But we can see here we've got this sort of sand coloured uh, plastic. This is our first sprue. Here we have most of the components for the roof. Um, we've got the rear doors there and a couple of chassis parts as well. And this illustrates the approach that Airfix have taken for a lot of this kit, which is that the roof parts and even the wall parts come in two separate sections, an inner section and an outer section. So for example, on the top right there, we have the inner part of the roof for the rear. And then just next to that to its left, we have the outer part of the same roof. That might seem a slightly odd way of doing things, but I guess it enables Airfix, or actually I think it's an academy tool, to get more detail on the parts. And it also means, of course, it makes painting a bit easier because you can paint the inner one colour and the outer a different colour without having to resort to any kind of masking or anything like that. The second sprue contains the parts for the sides of the vehicle and the floor, as well as we've got the stretches there and some cushions as well. And finally, the third plastic sprue contains lots of bits and pieces of various things. So we've got the wheels on there, the tires, uh, the mud guards, and a few of the bits and pieces, suspension components and so on. We also have this separate piece here. I don't think this did break off the sprue. I think it's supposed to be separate. This is the bonnet. And we have a clear parts bag which by my count includes more clear parts than the kit requires. So by my count, the kit requires two clear parts for the front windscreen, one part for the door between the front and the rear, and that is it. But we've got some extra parts there, so I would imagine this suggests that Airfix are certainly thinking of bringing out some new versions, some new variants of the, uh, of the K2 ambulance. Or maybe even just of the the Austin K2 itself with uh, different um, different loads on the back. Moving on to the decals, we've got a lot of crosses here, all in slightly different sizes. And we've got those ones for the rear door there in the bottom left, split down the middle to make it easier for you to apply. And on the bottom right there to go around the vents on the roof. So that's quite a nice touch. We've got a photo etch piece here, only a few parts. And then moving on to the instruction manual. I feel like Airfix have stepped up their game here. Not that their instructions were ever bad, but these ones do seem to be nice and clear. We start with the chassis here, getting it into position, putting some of the uh, engine detail in there. There's not a full engine, but we do have sort of the underside of the vehicle. As you can see, we've got the drive shaft and so on there. You'll see the A, B, C and D um, markers there. That's the call out for the different decal schemes. So if you're painting it in scheme A or scheme D, you need a certain colour. And if you're pa painting it in scheme B or C, you need a different colour for some of these parts. As with all Airfix instructions, it does quote only the Humbrol colours, which is a bit annoying. Especially since the Humbrol colour names don't really match the actual, um, well certainly not the wartime names, but not even necessarily the names of the, the general colours. As you can see, we build up the chassis, put the fuel tanks on, the wheels on. Then we move on to the um, single piece um, upper part of the vehicle, putting the stretches in the rear and some details in the front with this partition in between them. Spare wheel in the back of the cab. And then the uh, roof and so on goes on. You can see there we've got the option to have the rear steps either uh, folded or unfolded. And we do have a radiator inside the engine, although that grille on the front is solid, so uh, 
you're not going to see it anyway. Then a couple of final steps here. We've got two options for the lights. We can have them either with or without that um, blackout um, sort of hood there. We don't have any option for the canvas door, unfortunately. We can only have them folded up. Although, to be honest, it would be fairly easy to make a, um, a closed uh, door if you really wanted to. And you could just use whatever technique you normally use to make a tarp for that. I probably won't do that just because there's enough detail inside that I want to make sure it's visible. Okay, moving on to the paint schemes. This is our first one. So this is 30 car motor ambulance convoy, Royal Army service car, Northwest Europe, 1944. So this will be in SCC 15 green. And you can see what I mean there by the humble color call out. So this is in 253. This is Matt Dunkelgrun, so Matt Dark Green. Um, so a German color name there for the, uh, the British color equivalent. Lots of large decals there, big, big red crosses all over the vehicle. Moving on, we've got the um, counter scheme. So the splinter camouflage scheme here. Nice to see that Airfix have done this correctly with the Portland stone, the silver gray, which is that greeny color there. And then the top color, which is the slate, dark slate. The middle color here, the light green, which is the silver gray, is the one that has been mistaken in the past for the light blue by both kit manufacturers and also by uh, some quite uh, quite famous museums as well. So it's good to see that Airfix have got this correct now. And we've got those quite distinctive uh, red and white stripes there on the cab roof for this version. We've then got this version here, the British Army in Alexandria, Egypt 1942, solid Portland stone. And this is basically, without uh, calling it that for licensing reasons, this is basically the um, Ice Cold in Alex version. I do quite like this version, but I just think that painting a plain, single coloured vehicle is quite difficult in terms of the weathering. It's quite hard, I find, to get it uh, to get it to be very, very um, looking, looking very good. That's just my, my lack of modelling skills. And then finally, another green version here. This is the um, Auxiliary Territorial Service, England 1944. So of course, this is the version that's in that very famous um, picture of um, the Queen, or Princess Elizabeth as she was at the time, standing next to the ambulance. And again, this would be solid SCC 15. So you can see on those four versions there, there's a bit of variation on where those crosses go, hence why we had so many crosses on the deco sheet. Of course, the, the K2Y ambulance was so widely used that you could, uh, you could make up your own scheme easily enough. I think it's probably fair to say that any um, British camo scheme that was used during World War II could probably be applied to this ambulance at some stage. Let's take a look at some photos and see what's out there. So, of course, the version I've just mentioned and probably the, one of the most famous photos of this uh, vehicle here, Princess, Princess Elizabeth, in front of the uh, the one that's in the uh, fourth colour scheme there. You'll notice on this, that as in most of the photos, the internal um, cab paintwork is the same as the exterior base paintwork. A couple of ambulances here in uh, what's clearly a desert environment, so desert camo scheme. And another desert version here as well. This is quite a low resolution photo here, but it looks like the second scheme for the instructions with the splinter camouflage there. Look at the filth all over this vehicle as well. Look at those windows. That's something to bear in mind if you're doing that version. We also have this image here of the K2 being lifted onto a ship. That would make an interesting diorama. This is an image of the K2 being loaded with people from uh, one of the concentration camps after they were liberated. And you can see here all the workers are in some form of protective clothing, presumably to protect them against uh, typhus or something similar that was uh, diseases that were uh, running quite rampant in those camps. We've also got this picture here, which I'm not quite sure about the origin of, but this is apparently a K2 which was prepared to be sent to the um, Eastern Front, to the Soviets. Whether or not it made it, I'm not sure, but that's certainly uh, 
the backstory that I came, I came up with when I did some research into this. Another picture of the K2 here, and you can see that the um, it's a slightly different version. It has that exhaust pipe that goes up to the uh, the top of the vehicle. It also has the rear doors painted the same as the external colour, which is a, a variation you sometimes find. Sometimes it's done that way, I guess, to aid camouflage. Sometimes the internals of the rear doors are still painted white, as you can see here. And in fact, actually, that's the case here for the middle two ambulances, but not for the end one. So there's certainly some painting variation even between ambulances um, in the same uh, time period. Of course, the ambulance was also used by the RAF, so we have this option of this sort of blue-grey scheme. There's a little bit of debate, I think, about when this scheme was used and when it was stopped, when it stopped being used. But it's definitely an option for the, uh, the K2. And of course, we should remember that the K2 was used as an ambulance on the home front as well. So you can see here, this is looks like some kind of uh, aftermath of a bombing raid on a British city. And there are victims there being loaded into the ambulance. The other thing I noticed, and it's quite apparent in this picture here, is the fact that the rear of the ambulance is actually made out of canvas. You can see the ripples here with the, uh, the, on the side of it there. And on some photos, mainly on the uh, restorations it must be said, you can notice that the rear is a different colour as a result of that. I guess basically because uh, metal and wood absorb paint in a different way to canvas. I'm not sure if that's something that I want to emulate or not on my version. So yes, anyway, certainly a wide range of choices that you could go for there. And although you've got four great choices in the kit, you are no, by no means limited to the ones that Airfix provide you. So on we go with the build then, and this is the chassis built up. The fit here is absolutely lovely. All of these uh, joins were very nice, very square, very tight. And to illustrate that, you can see that in fact this is held together with nothing at the moment. This is just dry fitted, no glue involved, and it's all a very rigid fit. So it's a great start to this kit. There are a couple of eject pin marks, but they're in sensible places, like the insides of those side braces. I didn't remove those because they're not going to be seen. Of course, you could do if you wanted to. There is a line down the side of this piece here that I started to remove because I thought it was a moulding line. But uh, with hindsight, I think it's actually not. I think it's supposed to be part of the, uh, part of the kit there. Once our chassis frame is together, we have a little bit of engine detail so that it can be viewed from the underside. Some nice suspension components. And also an exhaust and a drive shaft. So basically most of what you would need and what would be visible from normal viewing of the vehicle from the side or even from slightly below. One thing I did notice is that you can't really pose the wheels at an angle. Um, you, there's no sort of workable steering on this, they have to be facing dead ahead. That's a bit of a shame, although I suppose you could sort of hack the kit to make it, uh, make it steer if you really wanted to. Okay, with the chassis frame built up, I moved on to the rear. That's this lovely single piece here with the wooden floorboard detail for the front of the cab molded in already. Half of these rails at the back molded in and then we add the second part there and that will provide a housing for the lower stretches. The only ejector pin marks on the entire kit that needed cleaning up were these ones here on the partition door this is the front side of that door. So they were filled with some um, acrylic filler and then sanded back once it was dry. We get separate pedal details, gear stick, handbrake and steering wheel of course. Actually I told a bit of a lie earlier, there are a couple more eject pin marks here that we need to remove as well on this door. 
We do have a few extra details here that go on this door, so a sort of a headrest and I think what's a fold down seat. I left those off for later because it would make painting much easier. These are the benches that go on the side of the ambulance and provide the upper stretcher bays. And they look really nice. They've got that sort of wooden floor there. There's no um, wood grain texture on the boards, but I think that's okay, it's not a major problem. And you can see how that stretcher fits in there nicely as well. That's gonna look really nice painted up uh, white with the, the wood picked out. This is the inner wall of the rear bay. These brackets are used to house those upper stretchers. I found it easiest to deviate from the instructions here and to glue the brackets to the um, stretcher bay and then just dry fit the entire thing into the wall to make sure it dried square, but keep it separate for later painting. Again, on the rear of this wall piece, we have lots of ejector pin marks, but they're completely covered up by the outer piece. So there's nothing to worry about there. This panel between the cab and the rear was surprisingly difficult to get into place. Though I suppose that's a good thing because it does provide structure to the vehicle. Here you can see the partition wall and the outer side walls in place. I deviated from the instructions and I glued those in place along with the rear. I deviated from the instructions and glued those in place along with the rear frame to keep them properly aligned. I was then able to slot the inner walls in and make sure everything lined up nice and square. I figured like this I would still be able to paint inside the rear without having to uh, keep everything separate and then start worrying about gluing painted parts. This is what the rear looks like with the roof dry fitted. So we've got that external roof and then the internal one as well. Oh lovely stuff, not a single bit of filler needed for any of this. And you can see here for example how those square first aid boxes fit very nicely into the square recess on the side walls there. Oh really well done, this was a really good job from Airfix and Academy. There are a few boxes that go on the underside that you can be glued in place now. The mud guards can't really go in place yet because we have to wait for the battery containers and they can't really go in place yet because they have to be painted a separate colour to the main bodywork. The rear doors are both single pieces with moulding on both sides. I'm not quite sure how that was achieved but there's no ejector pin marks at all on there. One small problem I did have is I noticed that the upper part of my cab roof was slightly bent. If I put the inner piece in here, you can see it just doesn't match up. It's just slightly warped at the end. However, this wasn't a big problem. I simply glued the two pieces together and then used some clamps to clamp the outer down to the inner and it eventually took the shape of that inner piece. The wheel instructions look a bit strange and they kind of imply that you have to put the hub in there before you put the two tyre halves together, but that's not the case. So if you want you could leave uh, D30 here separate, paint it separate and then drop it into the tyre afterwards and it will still go in. Despite being made of two parts the tyres went together very well and only a minor bit of scraping was needed to get rid of that tiny seam line around the uh, surface of the tyre. Again for the front and the bonnet, I deviated slightly from the instructions. I glued the bonnet to this window piece first, glued the dashboard to the inner of that window piece, and then kept the whole piece there separate from the vehicle to allow for easier painting and weathering, particularly that sort of footwell area in there. And there we go, that's looking pretty decent I would say.
As I mentioned, the rear steps can be folded or straightened. I went with mine straightened since I'm going to have the rear doors open. Uh, there's no point in building all of that detail in the back and then closing it up. Now I didn't film the painting because it's quite difficult on my airbrush booth. And also my, uh, my main camera lens is broken so we're stuck on macro lenses from now on until it gets repaired. But uh, I gave the entire chassis a coat of NATO Black XF69. And initially I thought I would give only the front of the cab a base coat of black because it would be too hard to go over the black with white in the rear. However, after a small experiment, I did decide basically to just base coat everything in XF69. And that provides that sort of nice uh, false shadow effect for uh, so much of the kit. Now, unfortunately, you don't get a figure with this kit. So I went into my stash, found the Mini Art British Jeep Crew kit, and uh, stole this guy on the bottom left hand side here to be my ambulance driver. As you can imagine that therefore hints quite strongly that I'm going for a desert scheme there. So he was constructed and given a black coat um, from below to act as sort of like a, a shadow. The next steps involved lots of masking and lots of airbrushing. So on top of the black, I put a buff color to act as the wood for the floor. Originally, I was going to do this and have it chipped back. So painted floor, chipped back to the wood. Then I changed my mind and decided to keep it pure wood. And then I sort of half changed my mind again. So I haven't really decided yet what I'm going to do. I might still do some chipping effects on that. Once the wooden parts were left to dry, they were then masked and everything else in the rear was painted white. I was really pleased with these results. Even without a wash or any weathering, the black undercoat still provides a little bit of variation that is the start of a sort of a slightly grimy look uh, for a vehicle that's been used. So I was very happy with that. And we've got some realistic chipping there on the stretcher handles. I accidentally picked it up when it was wet and pulled the paint off with my glove. Airfix also do give you the option of these sort of um, cushion pieces here. So those are for seated casualties. So the ambulance, the K2, can take four stretcher cases, or I think it was eight seated cases. So for the desert counter scheme, the splinter scheme, we have a base color of Portland Stone, BSC 64, which is this sort of very, very pale yellow color. And then we have the stripes of the silver grey, BSC 28, which as you can see is more of a sort of light green colour. It's almost like the, um, the sky colour used on early RAF aircraft. And then finally the third colour we have is the slate colour, which is BSC um, 34, which is sort of a, a dark green colour. These are all AK real colours. We do have an option, it was a standard option um, at the time, that we could replace the Portland stone with light stone, which ironically is actually darker than the Portland stone. It's a much more yellow color. In this case, I didn't want to go for that because it looks a little bit too bright for my liking. Again, I didn't film all of the airbrushing stages, but here we can see the base coat over the entire vehicle of that Portland stone. So I could stop painting now and just make this the, um, the Alexandria scheme. But it does look a little bit plain. I think even with decals, it just wouldn't quite do it for me. So lots of masking later. And we have here the three colors laid down. You might notice here that the decals are already down. That's because I forgot to film the paintwork until after I put the decals on. I did simplify the camo scheme slightly compared to the instructions, mainly just because I couldn't really interpret it very well from the, the top and the side view, so I, I did my own interpretation of that. I was really pleased with this result, I've got some nice straight edges there, 
It's quite bold at the moment, but the real scheme was like that. And of course it will tone down with some weathering. At this stage I also painted the distinctive red stripes on the top of the cab. And did the appropriate detail painting. Most of these were brush painted, but then for the leather panels in the back, I masked them off and used an airbrush. Moving on to the decals and the crosses that we need are the smaller variety. I didn't realise just how thin these decals were until I came to apply them. They needed just a few seconds in water, even in cold water, and as soon as I put them onto the surface, they, uh, they sucked right down onto that surface, even though it had a, uh, a gloss coat, and it was actually quite hard to get them into position to straighten them up as you can see here. I was quite fearful of tearing these but luckily I didn't. Initially I used some Tamiya Mark Fit to try to help them go down but for some reason despite a gloss coat I tend to have problems with Mark Fit over AK Real Colours. I'm not quite sure why that is but it tends to affect the paintwork. Anyway the decals went down fine. There aren't too many of them. As you can see they are slightly transparent. The camo stripes do sort of show through. I'm not super worried about that, and to be honest I suspect that may have been an aspect of the real vehicle too, painting uh, white over these darker colours. At this point everything was given a coat of VMS Matte Varnish, which is my new favourite varnish. It goes dead flat when you put it down, um, it's very efficient as well compared to the old Tamiya spray cans that I used to use. And here we have all of our sub-assemblies, all ready for some weathering effects now. Of course there won't be any metal chipping or rust work on the back of this vehicle because it's made of wood and canvas. I might do some chipping effects on the paintwork though. But I did decide to leave things here as they are at the moment, um, partly because this video is long enough already and partly because with my main camera lens broken I'm stuck with my macro or my ultra wide and neither of those are particularly helpful for filming um, build videos. So I'm going to leave you here with the shot of all the sub-assemblies and a quick shot of things just push fitted together. Those gaps won't be there obviously in the final model. Things are just very loosely fitted together. But I think you get an idea of how it's going to look and it looks pretty good I think. So guys if you want to see how this video looks once it's been weathered then be sure to come back to the channel. Hit subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. I'll be filming the next part as soon as I get my lens repaired. Um, if that takes a while, I have got another video in the pipeline that's finished basically and just needs editing, so I may upload that first. And before I go, and a special thanks to my Patreon supporters. Your ongoing support is really appreciated and makes a massive difference, so thank you very much guys. I'm very grateful for that. Okay, so I hope to see you in the next video, and until next time, have fun modelling.